Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 75, Ready to Go, Young Adults Roundtable, UCA Con 2023. Are you thinking of attending the next UCA conference? Are you in your 30s or below? Well, meet four amazing young adults who have made gathering together an intentional part of their life. Today, it's Timmy Paul Lupe, Lydia Lupe, Michaela Railton, and Luca Cacciatore. I'm just the fifth wheel, Mark Kane. <laughs> but wait, if you're well past your 30s, good news. This is also a chance to meet some of the next generation. Those who will take over for us, yeah, us, in a decade or two. I'm thrilled for what's in store. If you listen to these podcasts as I release them, then yes, you did notice a gap. It's been 10 weeks since we met Mark and Sandy and their prayer station in episode 74. But if you're just binge listening in, say, 2026, then just never mind. I had a lot going on, and I just couldn't do it all at once. It's good to be back. A few important things have happened in the meantime, and I'll get to those after the interview. The papers for the UCA conference have been selected. We have some new giving options so you can support the UCA projects you feel passionately about. And we'll have Keegan Chandler here to talk about one of those options. And yes, I'll be sure to bring up UFOs. I, I owe that to you. And I mustn't disappoint. We are two months out from the 2023 UCA conference, and we have had about half of the number of last year's total attendance already register this year. And a lot of people wait until the last minute, so maybe you shouldn't wait too long. Lots of first-timers are registered. That means even more new connections and friendships. Did you know that in 2021 and 2022, we had over 150 people there each year. Yet, last year, most of the attendees were there for the first time. Two-thirds of the 2022 attendees were first-timers. That's a lot of new people to meet. I think it will be similar this year. New smiles, new stories, and that palpable excitement that exudes from people who love the truth enough to endure the scorn of the tradition trumpeteers. Introducing four young adults who are resolute in their belief in the God of Jesus and who you will be able to meet in person this October. Timmy Paul, why don't you start us out just briefly? Like, this is the compressed, who is Timmy Paul, like in the elevator pitch kind of thing. Hey, Mark. <laughs> so, I'm Timmy Paul Lupe. I've been living upstate New York now for five years, moved in from the Congo. I uh, went to a two-year college called Hudson Valley Community College, upstate New York, hmm. ever since I've been uh, enjoying working for Living Hope International Ministries as a language translator and cool. facilitator for <laughs> our church here in the, in the United States in connection with the churches in the Congo, and also do some youth ministry here at Living Hope Church in Latham. Fantastic. And did, was it your idea to get Lydia to come over from Congo? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to claim that, but... <laughs> so, Lydia, you're Timmy Paul's younger sister. Tell me something about yourself. Okay, I'm Lydia Lupe. I am I am a student. I am from the Congo originally. I came here one year ago now. Wow. <laughs> I'm studying to be a teacher and work with kids. Oh, that's cool, yeah. And then, Michaela, you're joining us from the campus of Cedarville University in Ohio. Yes. I'm a sophomore at Cedarville University, and I'm studying social work. Um, hmm. But I live in northern Indiana. Okay. And Cedarville is a, <laughs> is it like a fundamentalist kind of Baptist group, right? I mean... Um, yeah, Cedarville is very intentional about their faith. So we have like chapel five days a week, and... Um, all the classes are from a biblical perspective, so I've really appreciated learning from them and what they have to say, and I think it's helped me to grow in my Unitarian faith as well. So, 
Hannah Dean in episode 47 yeah. had also attended Cedarville University. So if somebody wants to learn more about the university and what it's like, they can always listen to that too. But um, So it's kind of from the belly of the beast in a way. Like you are in their library right now. <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> All right. Luca Cacciatore. Tell me about yourself. Well, uh, there's not a lot to talk about. Um, I'm a writer, and I do that. I do journalism-type stuff. I didn't originate in that. I was going to college for political science, and then COVID hit, and it kind of threw me for a loop. I did welding for a year, and then I kind of stumbled into D.C. So I'm I'm doing that now. (laughs) I'm having fun, living life. Yes. It's it's great. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I was talking about Michaela being in the belly of the world of the Trinity. You're in the belly of politics right there in D.C. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And uh, it's as it's as bad and, and more than you would think. So, <laughs> Oh, that's terrible. Michaela, you're going to get expelled. They're going to be like tracking the uh, IP address activity and be like, <laughs> I think Michaela was. Did you have to sign like a statement of faith? Is that, is that what they um, there? Yeah, everyone signs a statement of faith. I somehow got around that. Wow. Yeah. So how how did you get around that? What was your technique? <laughs> Share the tips. Yeah. The only thing I did was I talked to my admissions counselor and I like explained why I couldn't sign it. And yeah, he was really understanding with that. So he like talked to his superiors and they were fine with it. They know that not everyone who comes to Cedarville is actually a Christian. So like even if people sign the statement of faith, there doesn't necessarily mean that they are actually a Christian. Mm. Mostly like the athletes and stuff, but <laughs> those athletes, yeah. pagans, all of them. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they should be a writer like Luca, and then they would be okay. No, you should not be. It's, <laughs> we're, we're 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 actually going to get taken over by AI probably before anybody else because mm. a lot of what we do is just aggregating. And you can get a uh, an AI, quote unquote, to, to do that stuff. So I actually need to think of a new career to go into very soon. Hmm. AI is ruining the world. I um, I want to move to Montana without any Wi-Fi and just uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pro- probably die from a grizzly bear. Honestly, I'm familiar with black bears because I'm from the Northeast, but. Grizzlies are they're they're a different breed. They'll run after you. They'll they they will try to kill you. They're predators. But <laughs> black bears are like goofy. They'll just like show up on your porch and just like sit there. Northeast. Where was the northeast for you? I grew up in Bucks County, which is a suburb of Philadelphia. Hmm. I was actually born in New York, but we moved down to Bucks County when I was very young. So I'm I'm a Philly kid. I mean, I grew up in the area. Okay. Um, so, Michaela, Luca, Timmy Paul, what was it about that first conference that is the reason you've signed up to come back again? Michaela. Well, I really loved it. My favorite part was just meeting everyone. Yeah, I guess being at Cedarville, I mean, it's a great community, but obviously it's like a different community. So, I'm still in the minority by a lot. Mm. So, it was really nice just to meet other Unitarians and even some my age or close to my age. So that was really nice. Yeah. How many of you young adults were there last year? Was it around 15 maybe? Oh, I yeah, I'd say it was around 15. That's that's a great group. That's good. Yeah. Um, and Cedarville is only like 30 minutes from where the UCA conference is being. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. really close. So. so Luca, how about you? Why did you sign up again this year? Yeah, I mean, um, so I really enjoyed the last time. It was it was similar to Michaela. I, I don't actually come from a Unitarian background. I, I was raised Presbyterian. Hmm. So I kind of like studied my way into it, I guess you could say. It was kind of the first time I was ever around other people that agreed with me in person. Mm. Wow. So that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. And since then, I... I uh, I now attend Grace Fellowship Church of God, which is uh, like an hour from me in Front Royal, Virginia, and I'm a part of their church. Uh, I think we're going to have a couple people that are going to show up this year, so I'm pretty excited about that, like bringing some other people Mm. with me this time. That is excellent. Yeah. Well, it was great to meet you last year. I was like, dude, this guy lives in Washington, D.C. I had to like make sure you went through the decontamination unit that that we set up outside. (laughs) Hopefully it worked. I mean, yeah, I I enjoyed talking to people, but... um, Hopefully they don't 
start coming to DC now. Like, but um, I'm kind of a nerd too, so I enjoyed the the presentations. I especially enjoyed uh, Sam Tiedemann's hmm. presentation on the Eucharist. I thought that was really really fantastic. Yeah. Somebody asked a question on Facebook. Why would I want to go to the UCA conference? Like, isn't it like this? Because they were looking at the Facebook group where people are, you know, how they are in Facebook land. <laughs> and it's like, uh, it's not like that. Not at all. <laughs> anyway. No, yeah. No, that is the problem with Facebook. It's kind of like misanthropic, you know, because you don't have that one-on-one ability to speak with somebody. So it creates these like antisocial environments and it, it's not it's not all bad because you get to connect with people you've never connected with but yeah. yeah everybody who shows up already knows that they're going to be around people who are might have different backgrounds so you're mostly curious you just this is your chance to meet them and ask them questions and find out you know how did they become a unitarian were you born a unitarian you know all of these things are just fascinating and it's way better than facebook i'll just put that out there yeah i was shocked how many people like actually didn't come from Unitarian backgrounds. Like I thought it'd be like the only one and everybody else would be Church of God or X way finding out that there was a lot of people that kind of, uh, you know, came from like broadly evangelical backgrounds that started questioning this later in their life. I kind of felt that home in that way. We had that family that came from California, the mom and dad and three of their teenage kids. And it was their first time too to be around others. It's beautiful. They were very, very cool people. For me personally, all the co- like what you do and what Sean uh, Finnegan does and Dustin and uh, you know the countless other podcasts that are out there, that's really how I uh, first approached this stuff when I was searching for for what my opinion would be on on this crucial doctrine. So I, I think that I think that having more resources like that is, would is going to help us in the future. I mean, that's how you reach the next generation of people. Well, and that's you. You guys are the next generation. So, you know, it won't be long. We hand off the mantle. (laughs) (laughs) So, Lydia, why is it that you want to go to the UCA conference since you are brand new? You've never even been there. I would say I would like to to fellowship with like-minded believers and to grow in the world and learn more about God and just to fellowship together. Yeah. The reason we're talking this time is because last year you guys had an impromptu young adult gathering, and I didn't even know this was happening. Describe how meaningful that was. So um, I can say that there was a need within the young people. Some of us just felt that need to have uh, young people speak together. One person uh, suggested that to us, and we were all like, yeah, I was thinking the same. We should do that. The young folks had prayer requests and they had that need to get to know each other deeper and we yeah. uh, share contacts so it's, it's, it was really meaningful. We created a group on Discord where we yeah. had the, the young folks who participated to stay in touch throughout a year. Very good. You know, we're already kind of minority because we aren't theologically typical and then I think it's my impression that there's more older people who are serious about this than younger people? Like, are there really enough of you younger people who care? Luca? I think we're just very scattered. A lot of the younger people that I know that have come to similar conclusions, people on Twitter that don't really know that other people kind of think like them. There might be some like Twitter interaction where they all talk to each other or whatever, but it's nothing super organized. Mm. And most younger people, uh, they don't come from Unitarian backgrounds. I mean, it's something that they later kind of develop. So Mm. I think that Dale and Dale's work debating people has kind of opened up a lot of that. People that otherwise would have never thought about Christology or theology getting into this type of stuff. Yeah. But I do think, yeah, there isn't enough young people. Yeah, it is the next generation. We joked about that before, but it's true. Like in 20 some years, people like me, I'll be in the 70s and I probably won't be traveling as much and doing things. Like the Church of God had a uh, young adult getaway a few months ago. And uh, Michaela, you were at that. Yeah. It, it was a similar kind of thing, right? Describe that. So it was just um, a really great time for like group discussions. Um, we had like sessions and... We had a time for worship, too. Since it was like young adults, it was 
great because we could spend more time getting to know each other and really focusing on the fellowship with each other. Yeah. So that we were more flexible. We had more time in the schedule to go do things like outside. Mm -hmm. Having time to, to get to know each other is probably the single most valuable point of the whole thing. Yeah, definitely. And that's what the UCA deliberately does too. We're like, well, okay, the conference is going to have decent gaps between the sessions. The afternoon's going to be really wide open with things. And yeah, the young adult getaway that the Church of God have, that was on the UCA events page so that people could go. And I think you even had like five people that came just through that connection to the UCA. Yeah. That's cool. Mm -hmm. You know, I was uh, planning to join that. Uh, unfortunately, the timing was the same as the family camp that our church does. So, mm. But I was like, man, this is exactly what, you know, the youth needs. And to go back on your question, I think, as Lucas said, uh, you know, first we are spread. But when we get together, you can see the mm. flame is there. Like, <laughs> I'll say we're very motivated. Like, I am personally very motivated. I love digging deeper, uh, getting, you know, to know more the truth from the Bible, you know, what it is telling you about God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Even the fuel, I was leading a group of young people. So I can see the passion they have for God. So I think having opportunities and meetings like this, like the UCA conference, the young adult getaway is really what we need, like more of that. Yeah. Well, I talked with you a few weeks ago, Timmy Paul, and said, okay, well, let's do something deliberate this time. Last year, it was a surprise. Look, they're in a room talking. What's happening? You know, this time, it's not going to be a surprise. Yeah, so I am very blessed that the UCA now has thought about us. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we have done last time, like meeting to pray, to get to know each other, talk, we can do it now. You know, everyone will know that it's happening so we can have high attendance. And mm -hmm. uh, prayer was so needed. I can see when we had topics on the board, like there were a lot of topics there, like people needed prayer for. So we we're definitely going to have that. And I was suggesting to friends to share something like like a small sharing, like, uh, you know, what God placed in their heart to do. Mm -hmm. Also, um, I think the... I think it's, it would be important to have the young people sharing testimony as well. You know, just like how God is leading their lives, what is happening in their lives, so we can also have time for that. Yeah. yeah. I know when we live in our own circles, where we're just around the same handful of people, it's so easy to forget what God is doing in other people's lives. And then you hear it, you know, you meet them and you're like, oh, it's so encouraging. So encouraging. Exactly. And so we've got two slots now scheduled for the young adults. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> One of them is during the day. I think right now it's set to Saturday afternoon, like after lunch. And the other one, we're going to officially put it on for the evening, uh, Friday night. So after the session is over and people are milling around, often folks will go places in town to hang out. So there'll be a place, I don't know what it is yet, but it will be specifically on the schedule that the young adults are going to have an evening together after that first night. And you'll get to visit, talk, and basically build some initial connections. And then the next day, you'll have the deeper time together. It should be a really nice combination. I'm excited to find out how it turns out. Yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah, I would like to like to share more time with new friends that we make, I hope. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, good time. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And for those of us who are extroverted and those who are introverted, <laughs> it's going to be a small group. So I hope that all of us, we have opportunities to express ourselves. Mm. So like if I showed up and I said, I feel young at heart, let me in, would you push me out? We would probably beat you up or something. <laughs> That's what we would <laughs> yeah. What, I mean, what is considered a young adult? I, I suppose somebody's probably going to ask that question. Like, well, you know, I'm, I'm 72, but deep inside, I kind of feel young. Like, is there some threshold in your head? That is a serious question. <laughs> what do you think, Michaela? <laughs> Well, I'd say if they're young at heart, then they should join us. <laughs> don't don't say that, Michaela. <laughs> You're going to have like 40 people pile into your room and be like, the average age is 58. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say the threshold's probably like gray hair, maybe. I, I, uh, I don't know. Well, at the, oh, at the one that, that, that you were at recently, Michaela, the, the one that the Church yeah. of God General Conference was sponsoring, I think it was less than 40 is what they had said. Yes. Yeah, people in their 20s and 30s. 20s and 30s. Yeah, I think that's pretty much, you know, good range. 
Yeah. I think it's no secret, though, that like there is like a, a lack of young people in the movement and specifically from historic, I guess you could say, denominations that are Unitarian. The kids have not stayed in the faith. Mm-hmm. And I think the reason for that is probably because in an effort to be accepted by other Christians, we de-emphasize it so much that the next generation doesn't even understand why it's important to maintain. Hmm. So I think that there's absolutely room to be ecumenical. I run a Bible study here in DC with a Lutheran, a Catholic, and we talk and we go through the Bible. It's a lot of fun. But at the same time, I think like we're all confident in our identities. We know what we are. You know, we've thought through this stuff. So I think it's important that like before we be ecumenical to other people, we also have a healthy confidence in what we believe. And yeah, yeah you don't want the kind of ecumenical that says it doesn't even matter what you believe. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Right. Of course. That's good. Did any of you do the, any of the workshops last year versus like the papers? I'm, I'm a nerd, man. I was I was listening to the papers. I love that stuff. So. I'm probably not the best resource for the workshops. <laughs> That's why I'll try to make a couple this time. But I don't know if if they're as entertaining as they were last time, especially, you know, Sam's and Dustin's, you know, then then I don't know. So I really enjoyed the workshops. Uh, one in particular with I think Amanda Dunn. Yeah, it was about children growing up as Unitarian and the challenges they faced at school. That was really good because. I hope if God bless me uh, with children to raise the children really the way that I think is great, yeah. you know, raising them with the biblical truth and giving them the environment for them to grow stronger in faith. Uh, so I did enjoy hmm. the workshops and that one in particular. Excellent. So Lydia, because this is your first time, I mean, you only get to hear about it through Timmy Paul. What is it that you are most anticipating? I would say the teachings because as you told me like it was great and to just to grow in faith and to be strong because we're going to be parents one day so it's really important for me to learn what is truth and to give it to the next generation too and i think there are uh, a lot of people to meet as well are you looking forward to making friends yeah <laughs> famous people <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't wait to meet famous uh, UFOologist Keegan Chandler. It's going to be fantastic. Oh, man. No, I love Keegan. Yeah. fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that might come up at the end of this episode. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, it better, yeah. Uh, Michaela, are you going to be able to bring anybody from Cedarville? Have you found any others like you there yet? Um, no, I've definitely not found anyone else who believes like I do. Yeah. Um, but I have had multiple conversations with my friends and I brought one of my friends to church with me one time and the pastor was making an announcement for the UCA conference and I saw her like taking notes and she was like Unitarianism like what does that even mean so that that started a a cool discussion after church so and where would that be because somebody who's like thinking Cedarville isn't near a church is it um, well, Cedarville is like half an hour from North Hills Church of God. Okay. So, yeah, I go there every week. All right. And so he, he mentioned it there. Did that turn into a an interesting drive home? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it was a great discussion, though. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yep. And we're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> that is the, the fascinating thing. I mean, in my experience, some people will treat it like you just told them you were a murderer or something. <laughs> And they'll just get so offended. And it's like, I, whatever, like, I, I can't help you with that. Um, some people are totally cool about it and they're just interested to hear more. Yeah. Um, and, and others, uh, others just don't know what you're even talking about. <laughs> you know, you have to walk them through it. But I will say this, the, you know, we have a uh, dissenting opinion. I think the burden of proof is on us to present why we think we're more correct on something like this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Having the opportunities to getting the tools we need to not only be in the defensive, but also offensive, like in a way that you present the reason why you believe in what you believe. Like, you know, I remember going to the fuel and uh, Josiah Kane and his wife had this class, <laughs> biblical Unitarianism versus Trinitarianism. 
for me, I, I learned so much and I was very motivated. And I went on Facebook. <laughs> I wrote something that uh, through Christ, he has set me free. And uh, there is this friend of mine for a long time. And then he went there talking about Jesus being God and things like that because he thought I, I, <laughs> I said that. <laughs> and I said, oh, respectfully, I didn't say that. So we started discussion. And actually, my reply to the, to his writings is still there. And the discussion has been going. It has been very respectfully done. Mm. So it is really important to go to conferences and go to workshops, get the knowledge, because I felt very confident in what I believe to be true. And the man said, oh, I, I really respect you for this and things wow. like that. So well, that came out good. Uh, and it's still ongoing. So I guess for me, I really appreciated how the UCA conference really emphasized like theology, because I feel like lots of other events don't always focus on that. So it really did help prepare me to like have these discussions with the people around me at Cedarville. Yeah. Also, I have been very blessed with like their responses to me telling them what I believe. So yeah. that has been a blessing. Yeah. And I, I would just say that although we're like a small movement, the amount of like high quality people is really insane. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have some of the smartest people I've ever yeah. I've ever met, you know. So yeah. I think it just comes from the fact that, you know, holding an opinion like this, you kind of need to know your stuff because you're going to constantly be inundated by people, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. So for me personally, reading up on church history, reading up on a lot of this stuff, it's made me appreciate, you know, other doctrines that I would have never even considered before, right? So it affects everything else. Like, so my descent into, into learning about Christology has influenced everything. I think it's just made me a, a smarter Christian. It's made me somebody that can engage a whole number of things with people. Mm. It's my perception that the younger generation, because there's so so much less cultural Christianity, uh, you know, 50 years ago, you just went to church, everybody dressed nice. You know, it felt like everybody was a Christian, even if they weren't. But nowadays, like there's no obligation to put on a Christian looking face. And the young generation has a lot of skepticism and doubt. Yeah. Is that making it easier to engage on the topic of Christology and theology because they don't have as much, this is just what I am and I've been this all my life and my mother was this and my pastor was this. Because well, well, I'll say being in DC, like Aaron Wren talks about the positive world, the neutral world and the negative world, which goes through the kind of stages of Christianity in America, right? So he talks about the positive world, which we would consider like pre-modern America. Mm -hmm. And then the neutral world, you could say existed in a lot of American communities and stuff up until the mid 2000s. Christianity wasn't seen as, you know, a net good for most people or cultural Christianity, but it was like, it was what it was. But with the rise of secularism, especially within our generation, college campuses, uh, cities like the one I'm in, it's, it's almost a negative now to be a Christian. You're, you're seen as like a less enlightened kind of individual. It's hard to talk about Christianity with anybody, hmm. like even the basics of Christianity, like, oh, you must be stupid if you believe in this type of stuff. So I almost never even get to talk about Christology with people, unless I'm already talking to a Christian. Hmm. You know, working as an evangelist, so at least following that path here, living hope and trying to put people together, it's a difficult world that we are facing, as Luca has shared. We, we come in and crushing against this wall like oh uh, these christian people are weird uh oh you you believe in that really oh you are uh you don't have a lot of freedom your life is boring <laughs> with the activities that i do here around the church um you know we're showing the world that yeah we like to have fun we we, we do ice skating we do you know movies those type of things so to build a rapport with someone and you know then have opportunity to talk yeah. about it so then michaela's in a in one environment right now, because she's surrounded by Christians for which talk of Christi Christology would be possibly one of the first things that could come up. Yeah. Whereas you, Luca, and Timmy Paul, you're like out there just getting over the hump of, wait, what, Christian? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, I'll share this from my country of origin in the Congo. We have that culture of respect. When someone is older than you, even just one year, you respect them. You listen to what they're saying. Mm. With my experience, evangelism is easier there 
people will listen to you, um, will respect you. So coming here in the United States, I'm like, wow. So I have an uh, opportunity to work with the children. And I can see how the dynamic is different. Over there, because I'm just older, I am respected. I'm listened to. I'm like, oh, do that. They do sit, sit, read the Bible. They read. Here, I have to. It's, it's different. I have to be tough but soft in the same time. Not too tough. Not too. I don't even know if too soft is a thing. But uh, so I have to have some balance to approach the, the the youth in this country. So it has been very interesting experience for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess. In a culture, in terms of young people like you, the people that you might come in contact with, you probably have a lot of folks then who they may not have even really thought about the Trinity. So if you're prepared to answer questions and you're explaining your faith, it may just make sense to them. Yeah, I think that's true. So the people I've talked to that don't come from a Christian background, they don't have like very defined beliefs, um, if I'm able to get through that barrier they almost immediately would say that like what I'm saying makes sense hmm. in regards to God and his son. That's not really anything controversial for them. In fact, sometimes they'll complain to me about how complicated, you know, the Trinity is, um, how they never really got it. If they hmm. grew up, if they're like a lapsed Catholic, how they never really got it when they grew up in the church. Huh. In terms of that, I, I think we do have an opportunity in the fact that what we believe is quite easy to understand um, and easy to prove as well. We have a lot of proof texts in the New Testament, believe it or not. So, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> exactly. Uh, interesting. Yeah, I have uh, I have a friend who grew up Catholic, but he was not really paying attention. When I share with him my faith and believing in one God, he embraced it. He said, "Oh, yeah, that this makes sense." And it was very simple for him. Yeah. And that's actually part of my story. I mean, I, growing up, when I thought of God and Jesus, I always thought of two different persons and not just like persons in the way that Nicaea <laughs> means them, like, like real, like real intelligent persons. Yeah. Um, separate entities that are connected to each other through the spirit. Like that's how I imagined it. Yeah. And that's also how my dad imagined it. So after I came to the understanding I did now, you know, when I presented to my dad, you know, I, I probably did the worst thing you could do. I told my dad I was a Unitarian. <laughs> and he was like, oh, my God, that's horrible. And I'm like, no, 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 let me explain. So then I explained to him what I meant by it. And he's like, oh, I believe that. Huh. And I was like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, I'm, I, I believe that, too. Like, I don't, I don't get what the big deal is. So I think our biggest problem that we have, it's a marketing problem. We kind of need to reclaim the word because whenever you bring it up, and I, I like that the UCA is doing this because whenever you bring it up, they might actually agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get this next generation ready to go, you guys. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we are ready to go, my friend. <laughs> well, I'm so looking forward to having you all there. I don't know how many new people will come that are in the young adult range, but my hope is that some of them who are on the fence listen and be like, these are great people. This sounds like an experience that's worth taking the time to do. And I totally believe it is because it's transformative, especially the people who are isolated. It's too much to do it alone. Yeah. That is the church, right? I mean, the church is community ultimately. Yeah. And uh, during Zoom and everything, I, I just didn't, I didn't feel that type of fellowship, uh, getting back into the church and being around people. And then you know, UCA and all this other stuff. Like, it's just, it's the way you're supposed to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. Lydia, what might you say to somebody who's also never been to the UCA conference to convince them to join you there? I would say just come to try because you never know what you will learn and like who you will meet. So it is important to come. I am like an introvert. I don't talk much, but if you're like me, you just come and share and Meet people and learn about God and learn from others. And Michaela, you're going to be back for the second time. Yes. Since I like grew up as a Unitarian in the faith, it means a lot to see people who like have studied their way into the faith. It's a really cool experience, and it's fun to meet everyone. Those people who, who got there the hard way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, that's some serious respect. That takes work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as young adults, you know, Moving on different stage of life, you know, those who are single and those who are married and those who are, I don't know. Uh, I'll just say that it's very important to come to gathering like this because you you never know what, you know, God can be, have in store for you. 
uh, in matter of meeting people. Um, Wait, <laughs> you, you, I feel like I'm reading between the lines there, Timmy Paul. What do you, what are you saying? Are you saying that single people can meet others? <laughs> well, uh, you know, to not use so many words, I think it's, it's, uh, it's an opportunity as well. Uh, you, you never know. You never know. You could get an awesome wife at the Unitarian <laughs> Conference. <laughs> but uh, yeah, seriously, you know, my friend now living in the South, he's considering coming to just see, uh, as Lydia has shared, he's also an introvert, but mm. told me about it last time. Hey, send me the, the information. So mm. it's it's good. We see some new people and see some, those of us who were there already yeah. um, and, you know, just gathering together, you really never know. Uh, yeah. What God can have for you there? Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, we're laughing about you know meeting your spouse, but that isn't really funny. I mean, that's serious business, uh, especially if you feel like like I I don't have anybody near me. How am I going to make a connection? And what am I going to raise my kids half Trinitarian and half Unitarian? Binitarian, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. And in New York, in particular, where I am, uh, the culture is very different. You know, I think Lydia felt the same. You tell me if I'm wrong. So when we go to other states and especially, you know, meeting the people who believe like us, it's like there is a connection like these people are my people. Mm. <laughs> We're resonating in the same rhythm, I would say, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's really good to travel and go different places, especially coming to the UCA conference, things like this. Well, thank you so much, guys. I, I'm so glad this worked out. And this is like the largest roundtable ever on the UCA podcast. Five of us at once. Uh, so well done. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Meet these folks and many others this year, October 19 through 21, at the Lawrenceville Church of God in Springfield, Ohio, for the 2023 Unitarian Christian Alliance Conference. Learn more at UnitarianChristianAlliance.org. At the conference, there will be seven papers presented, and the blind paper review has concluded. Luca, here's the list I promised you. Ignatius of Antioch by Nathan Massey. Incarnation of Wisdom, Dustin Smith. Jesus, God and Savior, Jerry Weirwill. Prayer to Jesus by Will Barlow. Deity of Christ from a Greco-Roman Perspective, by Sean Finnegan. Ten Arguments for Unitarian Inclusivism, Dale Tuggy. And finally, Unveiling the Double Narrative, from Sam Tiedemann. I know, it's just the titles, but we'll have more information in blog posts and in the conference schedule, so stay tuned. It's mailbag time. Martin writes, First, thanks for the podcast. I've been jonesing so bad, I... Okay, I'm embarrassed to say I wasn't positive what jonesing was, so I looked it up, and it's having an insatiable craving. Anyway, back to Martin. I've been jonesing so bad, I started at the first podcast, and I'm binging my way through them. Again. I'm a professional truck driver, and your podcasts, among others, like Trinity's and the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, are educating me while driving. I've been a nominal Christian, and sometimes the foulest of people, for about 63 years, since age seven or so. Four years ago, I was frustrated with my spiritual condition and biblical knowledge, and decided to go back and read the New Testament without any preconceived notions. I had so many unanswered questions. I downloaded four different translations of the Bible, Strong's Concordance, and a Greek-Hebrew dictionary and away I went. Shortly after I was searching online for more tools and ran across a website called The Bible Answer Stand, Craig Blumel answered the questions posed at a street ministry that he had started and later online. He's no longer with us and his website has been taken down. Here I learned that Jesus wasn't God and there is no triune God. I checked everything I read on this website and others. After about three years, I came to the conclusion I am a Unitarian, and I didn't even know what that was. Then I found you and Dr. Tuggy and Sean Finnegan and Anthony Buzzard and others, 
it's a relief to know I am not alone like I thought I was. This came with a high cost, to me anyway, but I can't go back. Thanks again for your podcasts, Martin. Wow. Thanks for writing, Martin. I don't know why, but it's oddly satisfying to imagine a big rig growling down the highway with me, little old me, billowing out the speakers over the giant steering wheel. Mm, That's cool. (laughs) Well, Martin, since you're on the road now, pull the air horn for me or engage the Jake brake. And let the world know that I read your letter. Thanks, Martin. Your note was very encouraging, and it makes me a bit sorry I missed so many weeks. But I'm glad to be back. Write me or email me an audio clip, podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. I've heard of several cases in the last months of people meeting through UCA Connections. If you haven't put your spot on the map yet, do consider it. It doesn't cost anything, but there is an option to give a little each month or each year. That goes into our operations fund and covers costs like hosting the website and the podcast, website development, and most notably, our annual UCA conference here in the United States. UnitarianChristianAlliance.org But now we are pleased to introduce three new giving options each providing a unique opportunity for donors to directly contribute to specific areas of our mission. These are targeted funds, and they allow you to actively participate in our initiatives that align most closely with your passions. First, there's the International Conference Fund. This fund is designed to support efforts in hosting the UCA conferences outside of the United States. Contributing to this fund helps with venue down payments and expenses, meal costs, and basically to help ensure that as many people as possible can participate. Second, there's the Marketing and Advertising Fund. This fund will be used to create compelling content, promoted on various platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, and other online channels. It will also cover tools, software, and fees. Support for this directly translates into more people encountering the message of our marvelous, unique creator and his authentic human son. And third, the publishing fund. Keegan will help me discuss that in a minute. But here's the point. These are to empower you to give to things that resonate most with you. And your giving will go directly to those efforts. These funds operate in parallel to the main UCA operations fund and that's supplied by the donations of supporting members. And that's what keeps the engines running. To learn more, go to unitarianchristianalliance.org forward slash donate. Now to the publishing fund. Today, offering the kind of thoughtful, articulated clarity he certainly inherited from his mother, Hildy, episodes two through four of this podcast, it's Keegan Chandler. So Keegan... Before we talk about the publishing fund that we just started, I'd like to have you explain the mission of the publishing committee. So the publishing committee is an effort developed by the UCA board in support of the UCA's broader mission to, on the one hand, spread awareness of Unitarian Christian theology, and uh, on the other, to connect like-minded Christians together. Part of uh, what the publishing committee is focused on is in supporting and generating new interest in Unitarianism through publishing. At this stage, the publishing committee's efforts are focused on print publications, Uh, but not just any print publications. It's not producing flyers or pamphlets, uh, small group study materials, though these are not necessarily bad ideas. Mm -hmm. Presently, there is a targeted focus with the resources at hand to support a um, UCA-related effort that many people, uh, even in the Unitarian Christian community or even avid listeners of the UCA podcast, might not be fully aware of, and that is a related entity named Theophilus Press. Describe that for us. Theophilus Press is an imprint. It is a publishing house that's set up to publish high-quality scholarly or academic works, presently focused on works related to Unitarian Christianity from a historical theological or philosophical vantage point. What is an imprint? 
It's essentially a publishing arm or a wing of an organization. Oh, okay. Okay. I should know that. I'm on the, I'm on the board. <laughs> <laughs> the publishing committee has a specific mission and Theophilus Press is simply the channel by which that mission gets accomplished. Okay. So why does Theophilus Press have a focus on scholarly or academic works? The UCA Social Media Committee's video projects, they have a certain audience in view. They are designed to target people who watch YouTube, for example. Yeah. And their approach is based on user analytics, among other things, in order to reach types of people in the way that they're expected to be reached, uh, the way that they're needing to be reached. If the data shows that everybody hates four-hour-long videos, well... <laughs> Despite the fact that I may personally be interested, <laughs> yeah. the social media committee may bypass my minority preference and focus on the audience that makes the most sense with our current resources. Mm -hmm. Which is why they're shorter. They have more animation. They're meant to just really get people engaged in the idea and think through a couple key points and then send them on their way. That's right. It's a targeted message for a specific audience um, yeah. and in a format that suits that medium. Yeah. In Theophilus Press, I and the other editors are operating in a similar way. There is a core constituency when it comes to reading books about Christian theology. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and even within that constituency, there is a subset, which we can call scholarly or academically inclined readers. And that's the target audience for Theophilus Press publications. Theologians, historians, other kinds of scholars interested in Christianity, pastors, professors, and educated laypersons in the church, or maybe people who would like to become educated on these subjects. That's our mm. current interest. Okay. Go in a little more detail about why you would focus on those people, given, you know, there's so many books that are potentially possible, and yet you're targeting a more scholarly and academic reader. So I'll use an analogy that I've thought about that might be helpful for your listeners to understand why. Okay. It's an analogy of a sandwich, which <laughs> is probably a really bad idea to talk about because I'm really hungry right now. <laughs> but uh, if you think about Christianity or Christendom as a sandwich, a very important layer is what we might describe as the bottom bun. This is Christianity at the ground level. Christianity in the churches, sitting in the pews, the grassroots people and networks of people who compose an interrelated web of communities, denominational or otherwise. Okay. These are not your scholars or your professional theologians. These are your average Christians who care about Christianity, who care about the gospel. Perhaps they're Bible readers, perhaps not. Some of them are tremendous students of the Bible, but they are academically inclined in a general sense. Okay. But without these people, Christianity would be the exclusive realm of the scholar, and therefore it wouldn't be Christianity as we know it. Yeah. This um, bottom bun is where what scholars might call lived religion actually takes place. Okay. Now, the meat of the sandwich and all the fixings, so that's the theology. So the network of people beneath are there because of the theology. But what about that top bun? This would be the scholarly class. These are Christian theologians, professors, philosophers, or influential writers, again, uh, perhaps even well-educated laypersons in the church. This group of people has a special role in the sandwich, and that's to hold it all together. <laughs> They're just as important as the bottom bun. They create a downward pressure, which keeps the theology squarely on the bottom bun. They keep it in place. <laughs> the, the, the top bun sets the tone for the rest of the sandwich, if you will. I love it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably hungry now, too. My apologies. <laughs> so without the bottom bun, you don't have a sandwich, right? Mm -hmm. But without the top bun, you might not have a cohesive sandwich for very long. You might have one for a little while, but eventually your theology is going to get all over the place until the sandwich doesn't really look like a sandwich anymore. Maybe it looks like a meat platter or something. Mm -hmm. The UCA Publishing Committee is focused on that top bun which will have a downward pressure on the rest of the sandwich. It will have a trickle-down effect. Scholars, theologians, these are the ones who are instructing pastors who are then ultimately communicating to Christians at the, at the grassroots level. So we think that's a very important audience to target. And the primary way that the UCA Publishing Committee is doing this is through supporting Theophilus Press. I see. You can go through an entire seminary and come out the other side and still have never really heard a cohesive explanation of what Unitarianism is. And what you're saying then is 
they need to come out of the seminary knowing that this is a real thing. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's the bottom line for Theophilus Press. Its mission is to publish academic literature that is worthy of capturing the attention of Christian scholars. So this operation is a fully fledged imprint, which is interested in bringing to light new perspectives uh, in the fields of theology, biblical studies, and history. And it's doing it in a way that in terms of style, uh, in terms of editing and the technical quality, it's doing things in a way that's on par with other major academic publishers. In other words, it's committed to advancing the very best, not only scholarly literature, but also in the presentation of that literature, which is whether we like it or not, uh, extremely important. When you see a Theophilus Press book, readers of scholarly literature will say, wow, this is a text that needs to be taken seriously. And I think we have uh, taken it seriously, and I think we've only just begun to do so. It's um, been a, a great experience so far to see how our editors have been able to work together with our proofreaders and a variety of other volunteers. Everyone's coming together from a variety of backgrounds and disciplines to work on something truly excellent. And many of the uh, participants, they hold degrees in theology and history and philosophy, uh, but some of them are professional copy editors uh, and writers who've been able to lend their skills and their vision to this project. And so far, I've been very proud of the team and its ability to professionally edit, typeset, design, and ultimately print the literature. But I think there's much more to come from this effort in the future. Let's just talk about what we have published so far. Well, uh, in talking about our first publication, uh, this is an opportunity to discuss another aspect of Theophilus Press that we haven't touched on yet. And that is its unique mission to not only publish content from new and dynamic scholars in the field, but also to preserve the unsung voices of Christian history. In other words, to produce scholarly and critical editions of classic works of Unitarianism, which contemporary theological prejudices have caused most people, even the scholarly inclined, to be mostly unaware of. Mm. And we completed one such project already, which resulted in our very first publication, which is a revitalization of a classic work of Unitarian theology by an English Unitarian named Thomas Emlyn. The name of this book is An Humble Inquiry, and it's available right now on Amazon. Your listeners can go and they can search Thomas Emlyn or An Humble Inquiry on Amazon and they'll find it. This book was painstakingly edited with uh, some of its language being updated for modern readers. Since the editors found this text so helpful from a theological perspective, they believed its content deserved to be made more easily accessible for a contemporary audience. Mm. The text also features an incredible amount of high quality footnotes and references. I was especially pleased with how these turned out. In addition to that, there is a sizable historical introduction, which helps us set the historical stage for this classic work. The feedback on this first publication, Mark, has been great so far. And we're looking forward to bringing many other such worthwhile texts to life that much of Christian theology and history has forgotten. Like the footnotes, for example, just as, an, as a point, there were some footnotes in the original work, but the new version has additional footnotes for clarification and details that may kind of be lost on people. And I think that's one of the best parts about it. It's like, unless you knew the history, maybe knew some of the names, you're looking at a Two centuries old book? Yeah, about three centuries old. Three. I, that's what I really liked about how we went about redoing it. I say we, it was actually you guys on the committee, not me, but. <laughs> and you were there in spirit, Mark. <laughs> and what are you guys working on now? The current project for Theophilus Press is a truly spectacular book. It's a groundbreaking book by a scholar named Dr. Thomas Gaston. This is a tremendous work of investigative history which sheds light on the presence of biblical Unitarian theology throughout the centuries of Christianity, and which ultimately traces this Unitarian theology all the way back to the first century Jewish Jesus movement. Mm. So Thomas Gaston, just to be clear, he's a Christadelphian scholar from the UK. Yes, that's right. Okay. Dr. Gaston argues that this body of theology, which historians have heretofore identified as dynamic monarchianism. Uh, this theology was present for a long time in the history of Christianity, 
and dynamic monarchians, or what we would call today biblical Unitarians, were not connected by personal contact, but because they all draw from a shared tradition of Unitarianism, we can identify them uh, as a singular tradition. And this tradition, as Gaston argues, actually predates the Trinitarian Christology and a variety of other Christologies. So the book is called Dynamic Monarchianism, The Earliest Christology. And it's a terrific text, even a game changer. I don't think it's a stretch at all to put it that way. (laughs) And I can't wait to see what people think of this publication, which Theophilus Press aims to have completed before the end of this year. And then after Dr. Gaston's book, the very next project for the imprint is actually a collection of essays by analytic theologian Dr. Dale Tuggy. Dr. Tuggy also serves as an editor at Theophilus Press, by the way. And uh, we're very excited to see this publication of his come to life, uh, which uh, should feature a treasure trove of helpful materials on topics related to biblical monotheism and the gospel. So uh, be sure to stay tuned to the website. That's theophilus-press.com for more updates on that. But this is just a sampling of the kinds of projects which the UCA Publishing Committee is supporting through Theophilus Press. And I'm really hopeful that Unitarian Christians out there will recognize the value of these kinds of publishing efforts and feel compelled to support them in any way they can, not limited to financial support, but even through giving copies of these books or recommending these books to scholarly people in their life, perhaps also to their instructors in college or their pastors and teachers. College libraries. That's another good one. Yeah. And here's maybe where the bottom bun supports the top bun in a very important way, which is in generating demand and asking their church leadership or the leadership of their local seminaries to take seriously the challenge of Unitarian theology by engaging with literature, which is very serious in every way. So you mentioned financial support. Obviously, this is why I have you on right now. We've just started a set of three funds, and one of the funds is called the Publishing Fund. So how could their support make a difference? Well, Mark, I very much wish that the editors and the authors that we're working with at Theophilus Press could simply do all of these things without requesting financial help, but that's just not the world that we live in. It takes funding, not simply to produce the final products or to facilitate the use of the software and the online services, but it takes funding to actually produce the content of the works themselves. Most of the editors and the authors that we're working with are required to have jobs outside of Theophilus Press. Mm. With one book, we haven't quite sold the number of copies that we need to make it a full-time job. Oh, yeah, I guess that's true. And Dr. Tuggy provides a great example of this, actually. Though he was a professor of philosophy at the State University of New York and Fredonia for many years, he now works in the private sector and has a responsibility of not only serving the cause of Unitarian Christian theology, but also serving his family through the work that he does. Mm. So one thing that your listeners might be interested to realize is that recent donations that have been made to the publishing committee have actually allowed Dr. Tuggy to devote less hours to commercial work and more hours to both editing and also writing his own material. I personally wish that he would be able to devote more time to sharing those things with the world. And we've been very grateful for past donations, which have helped to make more of this possible. So one day we'd love to employ Dr. Tuggy to work uh, on all of this full time, producing not only books and printed materials, but other kinds of materials as well. But at present, this is what I think your listeners should hear. If they want to contribute directly, not only to the editing, the technology involved, but even the actual academic content being produced, then they should prayerfully consider earmarking some funds for this endeavor, which is a project that as a member of the publishing committee, I feel quite strongly about in terms of its near and long-term value for the Unitarian Christian movement. Excellent. Thank you, Keegan. I appreciate you taking a few minutes today. Yeah. I want you to make a a mysterious alien sound so that uh, people can be then aware of your other episode that you just did with Sean Finnegan. (laughs) Yeah, I'll throw some alien code in there. (laughs) Well, for the record, I thoroughly enjoyed your interview with Sean about the whole UFO thing. The Restitutio podcast, episodes 508 and 509. There's a lot to be thought through there, and I think I think a Christian who's curious would do well to hear it from your interview, where you're getting it kind of a, a thoughtful and Christian perspective on the whole thing. It was fantastic. 
Yeah. Well, th- thanks for saying that. Yeah. You know, I tried to not push my own view, mm-hmm. you know, too much. And I just tried to really present a range of options for people. And, you know, it's probably obvious what I thought, but um, I try to just present a range of options and then just compel people that it's important and they should think about it now and not later and not hide from it, not wave your hand, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I feel very strongly about the subject. I, it's something that most people probably don't realize. They don't realize how much I do think about it. You know, I wish I didn't think about it as much as I do, but I just can't help it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, this story that's brewing yeah. presently, um, humanity on a wide scale becoming aware that we're not alone. Like it's, that's a really, really big deal. You know, people need to be ready. So they're not shocked. It's just one of those topics that is so disruptive that we owe it to ourselves to not be blindsided if something pretty remarkable happens in the next year or five or whatever. So many Christians just dismiss it out of hand, right? Yeah. But Christians should be the most knowledgeable on this topic. Like they should want to be the people that other people come up to and they're like, dude, tell me like, what is going on? Like, what do you think about this? Like, what does Christianity have to say? What's the Bible have to say? Yeah. Well, here we're doing the whole interview again, so I'm going to stop that. (laughs) Thanks, Keegan. In the coming episodes, I'll have someone on to talk about the other two funds as well in much more depth. That's the International Conference Fund and the Marketing and Advertising Fund. If you know someone younger who could use a nice autumn weekend pick-me-up, you know, hanging out with heretics who don't bend to the dictates of human creeds and traditions, Well, we've got you covered. Share this episode with them and let them know they are not alone and they are welcome to join us. Thanks to my star-studded lineup today, Timmy Paul and Lydia Lupe, Michaela Railton, Luca Cacciatore, and Keegan Chandler. That might have been a bit overwhelming. That's a lot of people. Sorry about that. But after 10 weeks, there was just too much piling up to hold back. I appreciate you being here with me, and I hope I can see you this October or at some event soon. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well. Hey, Luca, do an official introduction to the guest, Keegan Chandler. Right now? Yeah. (laughs) Introducing Keegan Chandler. (laughs) You didn't say the UFO, man. Introducing UFOologist Keegan Chandler. Thank you, Luca. (laughs) I don't know if I'll use that, but it'll be a good time.